Kia ora um, I'm going to start off with giving a brief overview of marine biosecurity and that will be from um, the role of biosecurity in New Zealand and then I'm going to be followed by my colleagues from Auckland Council and uh, Waikato Regional Council who are going to talk about their regional marine biosecurity activities. So just to put things into context, um, New Zealand is in the Pacific and it's sort of isolated but not really because as you can see from the lines on that map, we are highly connected um, by shipping pathways from a large number of places around the world. And this data was um, taken up to 2010 so you can expect that the, those lines are probably even more consolidated with more um, international visitors. So what that means is that we have been in the past uh, quite vulnerable to um, anything that might be sitting on the hull of a, an international vessel that's been in a place uh, that... <laughs> Thanks. Um, we're especially vulnerable from vessels that might have come from places that have other species that um, we would consider marine pests if they became established in New Zealand. And that can occur if the hulls of the vessels have not been properly maintained and uh, organisms or biofouling are growing on the hulls and in the niche areas like sea chests. And also if um, ballast water from a different location is uh, discharged in New Zealand waters. So uh, there are two recent initiatives to try and minimise the risk of organisms that we don't want in New Zealand um, managing to slide across our borders, our watery borders. Um, so ballast water, um, there is a requirement for all international vessels to exchange their um, ballast water from other countries um, offshore, uh, 200 nautical miles offshore or in 200 metres depth. And if they have an onboard treatment system, then they are to use that to treat their ballast water. And this slide here shows a more recent initiative, uh, the Craft Risk Management Standard, or the CRMS, just rolls off my tongue, um, and that is for any international ve vessel uh, wishing to come into our waters, and it is divided into criteria for two different types of vessels, um, vessels that are called short stay or intending to stay for no more than 20 days and the requirement is that they must have no more than a slime layer, some goose barnacles and a small, small amounts of um, primary fouling organisms like barnacles. For any vessel that uh, wants to stay for longer than 21 days, they have a tighter regime. They can only have a slime layer and goose neck barnacles. And they're allowed goose neck barnacles because they are known to be a cosmopolitan species. They grow everywhere and they are everywhere. So the craft risk management standard came into force last year, so um, we have a few issues to deal with in New Zealand and in the Hauraki Gulf about marine pests that got here uh, before the tighter rules and um, stricter conditions. So one of the things that um, Biosecurity New Zealand has to, is to have a surveillance programme looking for any marine pests that um, might establish in New Zealand. Um, the programme uh, began after a baseline survey in 2002, so the programme itself uh, started in 2005, and twice a year a team of Niwa divers and scientists go around um, a large number of ports around New Zealand and other high-risk sites, uh, which you can see on the map to the right and they um, have a list of species that they're looking for. So the top five species are not in New Zealand. We don't want them here. Um, for example, the Northern Pacific Sea Star um, is voracious. It's in Tasmania and parts of the southeastern Australian seaboard. It could easily get here. So we definitely need a surveillance team to be on the lookout as a first um, responder. Uh, we also have a couple of crab species not here. Um, a bivalve which clogs the intakes of boats 
and also Kalupa taxifolia, that green aquarium weed. So they're not here. Um, there are secondary species that are here and the dive team also is on the lookout for where they are. Um, so those ones include the um, club tunicate style, um, eudestoma, the droplet uh, tunicate, um, the Mediterranean fanworm, and, oh yes, the Asian date mussel. And you've got a few other species here in the Hauraki Gulf as well as those ones, um, including um, Charybdis, the Asian petal crab, which is a bit of a nasty, feisty animal, um, which will give you a nip if you dare to touch it. Um, and I think my colleague's just going to give a little bit of an overview and their talks about a couple of those species in the re their regions. So how are marine pests, and we have to include diseases as well because there's a threat of some diseases, um, how are they spread? So there is natural spread. So once um, a marine pest gets into a location in New Zealand, natural spread would be by either the adults moving, if they're, for example, like a charybdis, um, or some, some other adult that can physically move around, and also by uh, larvae being released and swimming um, or passively drifting on water currents. And uh, key vectors that spread some of these marine pests around um, include vessel hulls and the niche parts of vessels like sea chests. Um, and so that's if the vessel hull hasn't been properly maintained, like given a clean and an anti-fouling coat. Um, movable structures uh, such as pontoons are another way to spread marine pests around um, if they've not been maintained. And equipment, um, an example of that might be, uh, but not only, um, for example, equipment to do with the mussel farming industry. And translocation of live organisms. So, uh, for example, shellfish that might have come from a source that's been heavily infested with marine pests. Uh, so, these, um, having these vectors uh, translocate into a new area then facilitates natural spread. Um, an example of a disease you would have heard um, that has been problematic is Bonamia austria, which infects flat oysters and there's been some really big issues in the Marlborough Sounds and Stewart Island. <laughs> Um, this graph is a little detailed, but um, if you just take a step back and look at the lines on the map, it's all vessel movements um, to and from um, Auckland, um, domestically within New Zealand. And this is for vessels over 99 tonnes, so mainly large commercial ships and barges and all manner of vessels. And by looking at these lines on the map, you can see that with Auckland having its range of pests or any other location in New Zealand with um, a number of marine pests, there is quite a lot of opportunity to spread these pests around the country. Um, with recreational craft, that's another equation as well. Um, I haven't been able to show it today in view of time, but um, if you look at recreational craft within the Waitemata Harbour, there are huge numbers of passages of vessels moving backwards and forwards from marinas over to Coromandel, up to Great Barrier Island, all around the Hauraki Gulf. So just a little bit of a, um, an idea for if you want to access some more information, um, MPI and NIWA have developed an um, information source called the Marine Biosecurity Porthole and the website is there to um, access if you wish. And if you want to find out more information about marine pests, any location around the country, this is a good place to start. Uh, it's in development, so we're always populating it with more information. And I've just put our 0800 number here. If you see any dodgy looking marine organism on the shore or underwater, please give us a call on that 0800 number and we'll try and sort it out, or at least give some information. Now, one really big recent initiative that um, Biosecurity New Zealand and MPI have um, undertaken is called Biosecurity 2025. It is both for terrestrial and marine. Uh, there is a big focus on marine biosecurity. And the goal is for everyone um, from all walks of life to work together. So that includes the public, Māori, or any kind of organisation and 
central, local and regional government. It's all considered to be part of one team. It's called 4.7 million. Um, it will probably end up being 5 million before too long. But we want everyone to work together to help with this thorny question of trying to control the spread of marine pests within um, Aotearoa. And so just finishing up, um, we've got a website uh, and the whole movement, it's a campaign, is called Kotato This Is Us. And I invite you to have a look at that website. There's a whole raft of new bits of information, um, new people joining and sharing in a real community collaborative sense. So thank you very much. Kia ora koutou. Um, so the Marine Biosecurity Programme for Auckland Council was established in 2016 and thanks to the Natural Environment Targeted Rate funding um, in 2019 we were able to expand that from SAM and take myself on board as well. Um, we are working closely on programmes that include education and engagement, uh, monitoring and surveillance, research and development and also looking at policy development and regulation. Oh. I'll learn how to work this. Um, so along, as, as part of our programs, we work closely with all of the other councils. Uh, we also work closely with MPI and um, other, area, other um, organisations throughout the country. There are two groups um, for the councils that are joined together. Um, there's the Top of the North, which includes uh, Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Bay of Plenty, also Hawke's Bay and Gisborne councils that we're working closely together with. And then there's also a Top of the South initiative, which is all the uh, councils joined up together there. Uh, so through, through these... Uh, through these programs and working together, we've developed some um, the clean blow, good to go. You may have seen it around. It's um, just making sure that everyone thinks about the bottom of their boats before they're moving around. Um, there's some really good websites, uh, marinepest.nz, which has got some information about the species that we don't want moving around. Um, we uh, we have a strong presence at the boat shows. Um, we attended the Hatch Wilco boat show earlier this year and we have the on water boat show coming up in the early October. Um, other initiatives that we've done locally is had staff out, um, out on the boat ramps and at marinas to talk, to talk to the public and educate them about the risks of marine biosecurity and the pests that are coming into New Zealand. Um, we are also <laughs> developing a uh, education program with Merck um, that will be targeted at the schools and be able to roll out for the younger younger children who are of, you know a very good voice for us. Oh. Oh, this is going. Okay. Um, so. And complementary to the high-risk surveillance surveys that are carried out by MPI and NIWA, we also do some of our own surveillance programs. Um, one of these is the Great Barrier Surveillance. Um, when the fan worm was identified out there, we got on board with the Bay of Plenty dive team and um, we are regularly monitoring that to look at to, to see if it's moving and, and hopefully um, ho hope that it hasn't been spread very well. Uh, sorry, excuse me, I only just saw this presentation last night, so I haven't. <laughs> um, we also, um, you may be aware if you've got a vessel and you've been up to Northland and you've had your vessel checked, um, they, they're running their program um, as part of a, um, a way to detect the pests that are moving around. We also do hull surveillance, um, but that's more looking to detect those new species that are coming in. Um, sorry, and I forgot to mention, oh yeah, we're going, moving down. So as part of the Great Barrier Surveillance that we've done recently, a new to New Zealand species was identified, the clavelina, which 
that one there, and um, it's one, a species which is known to be um, uh, can be quite detrimental to the marine environment and aquaculture, and it will just smother things. Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to speed through this. Um, so along. Okay, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, along with this, we support students to do research on some of the key species. Um, we're looking at some control tools to help stop species from settling and also looking at um, some ways that make, to make vessels cleaning, vessel cleaning easier. And we're also doing some work with Cawthron to look at behaviour change and how we can in incite those um, changes. Okay, I'm going to go really quickly. Um, there is some legislation that we have, some, we have some rules within the um, unitary plan. We have, working with the top of the north, we're doing interregional pathway plan, and there's been a recent, um, some recent work on that, and we, with Northland and the outcome, some of the options are just status quo, um, just doing, keeping your heart clean, or taking a little bit further and making sure that everything's involved. Um, and of the 300 submissions, that was the outcome that people are wanting things to be, um, like everything to be included. So we're looking at the big picture of moving pests around. Okay, so, and that's just the graph for it. And so the next steps, options, um, just to do some work and looking at um, the cost benefits determine, and to determine a way forward and then investigate implementation. And I'm gonna hand over to Mike. Kia ora. Hello everyone. Hey, so I'm just going to talk very quickly just to give you a kind of brief introduction to some of the kind of biosecurity concerns uh, in terms of um, uh, the Waikato region uh, and then um, just briefly talk a little bit about um, some of the work we, we have going, kind of going on. I, I guess just to make the point quickly that the, the Waikato is not, is not principally the place where vessels first come to New Zealand. So a lot of our kind of biosecurity by security concerns uh, associated with kind of uh, species which have already arrived and kind of uh, minimising kind of spread. Um, as you can see from this picture here, the, the, so in terms of the Waikato, we're, we're principally talking about the Coromandel Peninsula and Firth of Thames. We're sandwiched between the Waitemata Harbour, the most invaded marine space in New Zealand, and the Port of Tauranga, which is now New Zealand's biggest uh, uh, port. So in terms of um, just that kind of context, um, it, it's a, a huge challenge for us. And, and principally why we, we work with our, our colleagues at TON in terms of Auckland Council, Bay of Plenty, and, and kind of working with, with um, MPI. Um, so we have a lot of visitors to the Coromandel Peninsula, but we also have a lot of our own kind of uh, boat traffic as well. Um, we have plenty of activities which, which um, uh, have associated biosecurity risks with them. Uh, in terms of aquaculture, we have the movement of, of, of vessels, of structure and gear. So if we're moving material around, whether that be vessel structural gear or muscles, we need to be mindful of where they've come from, where they're going to, uh, and what biosecurity risks they, they may pose. Um, so I'm briefly going to um, just talk about a few of our activities um, in the context of, um, of the sea change objectives here. This work hasn't been done just because of sea change objectives, but I think it's a kind of useful context in which to, in which to talk about them. So firstly, by 2020, develop a pathway management plan. Um, so currently, um, as kind of previously mentioned, there, is a discussion, there was a discussion paper out between March uh, uh, and June. Uh, um, some options were, were put forward um, in terms of discussion with our council, uh, and there'll be further consideration uh, in the new year with our, our new council. Um, we also need to increase our kind of monitoring uh, and look for eradication tools and also increase stewardship. Um, so yeah, very quickly, uh, Sabella uh, Spanzani, probably heard of this one, the Mediterranean fanworm. So the picture on the left, you probably might not be able to see, see here, but uh, basically on the left hand side, 2014, it was first detected here in 2013 after arriving in Auckland in 2009. And you see the picture on, on, on the right hand side where, where its presence is growing through Coromandel Harbour. For the Waikato, another uh, added challenge is the fact there's no haul out facilities within that, that Cor Coromandel area. Uh, nearby, so, so, so there's added, um, uh, added, added issues there. So, so here you can see the spread, but I think, you know, we've talked uh, this morning about we can look at this in a negative way or we can look at it in a, in a positive way. 
I think one of the positives is, and, and this picture uh, shows where we uh, conduct dive, diving uh, surveys, uh, and this is the results from last year. So on the, on the, uh, on the eastern coast of the Coromandel, um, the, there's currently no new marine pests, so Sabella has not yet made it uh, across to the eastern coast, and, and that's the way we, we'd like to keep it. Um, in terms of uh, just in terms of, of, of monitoring, I think it's um, you can you can always be looking uh, you can always be monitoring for biosecurity whether you're out there um, you know recreationally uh, for, for having having fun out in the marine environment or if we're out there doing kind of biodiversity surveys uh, you can always be looking for for invasive and unwanted organisms and we need to look at better ways of re reporting as Kathy mentioned the, the marine biosecurity uh, portal there's also iNaturalist and, and plenty of ways of, of, of Letting people um, in, in the regions know when you found something and, and, and find out whether it's been found there before. Um, so here's some pictures here from a, a survey we did of former Pearl Harbor. Um, you see a, a huge, diverse range of or organisms. So we're, we're kind of capturing which, which biodiversity is found in this harbor. Uh, but one of the things we did found was, was, was this uh, this species, Caribdis japonica, previously been found there, um, I think, in 2012 uh, on, a, on a seagrass experiment. Uh, um, and we found it. Uh, we found one one organism um, most recently in, in 2019. Um, a lot of fungi is in, in pretty good health. It's not without its challenges, but I think uh, something we shouldn't forget is actually keeping the environment in a good state of health. It, it can, is actually one of the things that, that um, can, can uh, help reduce the, the biosecurity risk. So then, just a final one. Again, we, we've. We've heard it uh, earlier, but in terms of um, we have a role talking at places like this, to, uh, speaking with a lot of different different types of people, just just to talk about um, the education and kind of engagement of, of um, the, the knowledge around biosecurity, just so so people have a consistent message and, and know what to do. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Paul Quinn and, um, and Brett Bailey, some of the guys at WRC who work in the uh, marine biosecurity uh, in, within the biosecurity team uh, for their for their efforts here. And uh, yeah, thank you.